Hey guys, today we're going to be having a discussion with our chief industrial designer at Tivra, Utsav Jain. And we're going to be talking about the design development our helmet has taken over the iterations that it's had. So there have been three primary iterations, if I'm okay. correct. So the Gen 0, the Gen 1 and the Gen 2. And you've seen two of those three, but the changes go a little bit more than skin deep. So Utsav, beginning with the Gen 0, which I believe the public did not actually see. When you begun the idea for that helmet, where did you begin? Where did that initial design come from? This was the very first product for Tivra. Mm -hmm. And that was a helmet, a helmet which uh, we understood after understanding, after actually opening multiple other helmets, mm -hmm. getting to know that it has at least 42 to 49 parts. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, and that's a common number. Mm -hmm. So the initiation was to understand the purpose and then understand the limitations of it got it and after that getting into the detail of having our own point of views for every part integrated in the design so we didn't want to just take anything which was available without understanding if it could be improved for our users uh, in every aspect in terms of uh, functionality in terms of weight in terms of design preferences all those things were taken into account that is why we launched with gen 1 okay instead of gen 0 because gen 0 was a lot of learning okay yeah. so gen 0 yeah, more than 45 49 parts obviously a lot of parts involved and it's yeah. a great thing that whatever was added was added there for a purpose not just for the sake that someone else is doing it so we'll also add it so exactly. again good intent behind every design decision taken hmm. talking about the basic shape of the shell the contours on the sides the placements of the vents the hmm. shapes of the vents even was there any benchmarking done, any particular reason why those were where they were? Like, why that particular vent alignment? Why that particular contour on the side of the shell? So, any reason and logic behind that? Uh, of course, so there were two elements again for the deciding factor. One was functionality and the other was a pure common aesthetic point of view. Okay. Uh, but we wanted to take uh, a decision of out of the many categories of helmets and the sub divisions of the motorsports uh, category which one do we want to go for okay. so our decision was that we wanted to make the helmet for the street riders uh, nothing particular only for track mm. because we wanted to cater to the requirement of people who are riding faster bikes on the Indian streets Understood. and internationally mm. but they don't have access to the kind of quality which the gear uh, will give them that makes perfect sense so yeah. that is the gap that we were trying to fill hence we went for the more aggressive riding angles. Uh, our initial range for uh, you know the riding position was the 45 to 35 degrees. Yeah. So I mean, again, like reasonably tucked down. So you can basi yeah. basically a variety of postures from maybe a slightly aggressive naked to a properly committed sports bike. Exactly. That range basically. Exactly. But nothing all the way upright. Got it. Yeah. Something which is like the largest spectrum of the mm -hmm. bikes which are being sold as well. Yeah. So that was the idea. After deciding that. Uh, we also went into the CFD testing of our design and that also gave us the exact positions where the ventilation should enter the helmet and exit, exit the from helmet. the exhaust. Uh, similarly, the shape and the surface area covered by the spoilers and or other aerodynamic elements mm. on the helmet, which includes the contours of it, right. were placed accordingly. Awesome. So, it was all decided based on how we want the air to flow across the product and then the further modifications were done. So there were that two to three sense. rounds to take the final call, final decisions, change the contours, positives, the negatives of those surfaces. And uh, our overall idea was to not have uh, this, any surfaces protruding too much, you know, like beyond 4 mm. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, for, a, for a smoother flow. And if I may digress just a little bit, like this discussion is basically the core design of the helmet. Mm. But as you mentioned right now, the helmet is primarily targeted towards, I would say, semi-aggressive to fully aggressive riders yeah. and those postures as well. The color and the graphics also replicate that. Yeah, so, up to a pretty good degree, yeah. I would say. So, the intention of the helmet, what sort of riders it caters to, that is very much hand in hand with the functionality and the placement of the components on the helmet. Yeah. So, uh, going along the same lines, the Gen 0, I believe, had only one spoiler, am I right? No, Or actually, did that have two as well? So, the Gen 0 had two spoilers okay. as well. Uh, we had interchangeable spoiler feature for Gen 0. That was the initial idea because, again, we wanted people to have the control over uh, modifying their product versus yeah. their requirement of riding. Understood. We understand that a larger spoiler really caters to the requirements of better aerodynamics uh, and extended laminar flow, but it also hinders 
or smooth riding when you're riding with a pillion so that okay. was one major consideration why we also had a street spoiler option and we've had it in all the generations in one form or the other yeah uh, so gen 1 had the completely removable and replaceable option uh, Oh, sorry, Gen Zero. Gen Zero, and yes. uh, then Gen One carried on the same intention, uh, but there were a few problems. A few which, hiccups along yeah. the way. Yeah. So let's transition from Gen Zero to Gen One. What were the differences between those two helmets? The largest thing that we did, which was which is not a perceivable change. I mean, from a distance or anything, mm. but the contours of the helmet from Gen Zero to Gen One, okay. just the shell, mm. are actually inverted all the way. so all the positives yeah are in gen 1 and also in gen 2 all inverted and there was a there was a functional reason for it okay uh, it just improves the strength of a helmet uh, in terms of uh, if you know the terms like the c section or yeah. the i section yeah. of the pillars the beams uh, they have those contours for a certain reason because it just increases the structural integrity of a surface mm-hmm. so we wanted to do the same thing especially in the chin areas in terms of uh, an accident or an impact which one experiences mm-hmm. from the front straight head on right this area needs to be very strong and rigid absolutely and that is exactly where we were planning to further improve the helmet after testing the gen 0 and this was the decision that we took and actually was a really positive output that's good that's so good. we uh, continued with it Awesome. So yeah. basically, if we talk in like an architectural sense, it was a more strong layout for the internals and externals of the shell. Basically, yes. that that makes sense. So, what about the other parts? The vents, the spoiler, anything there? Vents, the spoilers. Yeah, of course. So, um, in Gen One, we were experiencing in Gen Zero. Sorry, we were experiencing the vents to move quite smoothly, but we wanted to add that ticking wala sound, which is actually a feedback for a rider who is not actually looking at the vents. Yeah. that are being opened all the way half way and what not that goes a so, long way for user experience exactly yeah. so a sound feedback is very important which we could not achieve in the gen 0 vent design Got so it. we went back to the drawing boards all the way uh, changed the design in terms of you know some engineering limitations which come up uh, mm. so we had to broaden the sizes of the vents a little okay. still keeping the surface level of the shell and the vents the same uh, so a flush surface outdoor but uh, a an overall bigger vent so that gave us bigger openings as well as more area to integrate that sound feedback the ticking system in each vent Understood. so the head vents the brow vents the chin vents all of them were now uh, given this extra feedback uh, we knew that it it should be there but we were only successful till gen 1 okay. to achieve that so that was a success again suppose spoilers gen 0 and gen 1 both had the same uh, removable and replaceable race versus street spoilers the only difference is that for the customer or the user of the helmet uh, for them to make it easier to assemble it on their own mm. we had this uh, i mean it was an aesthetic call previously in gen 0 to have these notches on the sides give it a good look yeah. but they didn't have any functional uh, purpose it kept the spoiler flush with the rest of the helmet yeah. no interruption no interruption basically yeah. so we just made a straight line over there instead uh, much easier to align much easier to make sure that the i mean there's no confusion as to where the spoiler goes right. there are three points which have to be met in terms of three screws you remove one you match the three, same three screws with the other spoiler and it's good to it's go it's sorted okay so we removed that we uh, you know went more into the minimal side of the designs from gen 0 to gen 1 over there um further going into inside the helmet um gen 0 we had the concept ready but by gen 1 we were able to achieve the two types of cheek pads that we were planning to mm-hmm. sell which was the street and the race cheek pads both the cheek pads cater to the same uh, face and head sizes but the only difference was that for uh, people who are you know intending to go on faster rides maybe take their helmets to the tracks or for some training purposes they want that snugger fit that makes sense huh? so that relativity we wanted to add by using different densities and a different architecture while still having the same size altogether right so that feeling of uh, the cheek pad not being too cushy mm. that actually makes you feel more secure it's it's like somebody is hugging you into security yeah. so that's the idea which you were trying to give with the street versus race cheek pads understood uh, and that was the other feature nothing to change but rather something that we want to continue Uh, until something genuinely better comes up is the double deering uh, retention system so i mean that is an ancient system of uh, reinforcing it your helmet works beautifully yeah, there's nothing that works better it, than it that it works so well that yeah. the only thing we wanted to change was the chin strap color yeah 
<laughs> that's all if you go on a track if you have anything other than a d ring you won't be allowed to go there yeah it's it's a yeah. strict no it's a strict no it's a yeah. strict no uh, just one more baseline statement in terms of cheek pad so you mentioned that the race fit has a higher density foam than the street fit we should mention for the viewers that under no circumstances should you wear a helmet that is loose so even the street fit needs to be reasonably tight your yes. yeah, the helmet should not move freely on your head at all uh we have a sizing guide on our website as well as a video i believe which you yeah. can refer to and the race fit just gives you that much more sort of firmness and security which exactly. you require in those sort of high pressure high speed situations yeah exactly so just adding to what we said there's a difference between tightness and firmness tight is something that is packing a certain distance and firmness is how hard is that distance being right. packed so like i said both the cheek pads cater to the same sizes hmm. race small and uh, street small are both small it can both fit so, the same yeah head, they yeah. will fit a small head size perfectly hmm. and they'll be too tight for a medium and loose for an extra small per se hmm. but a, a race cheek pad will be stiffer got it so that negative and positive flexion hmm. is reduced over time will there be sort of a less uh, usage based compression on hmm. the race fit so again the braking period as it is called uh, commonly that will be for both the cheek pads yeah. but the cheek pads are de- uh, designed using such uh, premium material that the breakage is also uh, calculated okay like that uh, 5 mm breaking mm. or the 3 mm breaking is also relative in the street and the race moving from gen 1 to the latest one which is currently on sale the alter ego 2.0 gen 2 gen 2 yes the very very nice helmet <laughs> i like it very much one of the biggest transitions which we didn't touch up on because it makes more sense to sort of integrate it here the shell size uh uh-huh. i believe there was a 580 shell there was a 620 shell mm-hmm. so the small and medium with the 580 and the large and the extra large or the 620 right that was the case for the gen 1 gen 2 we currently only have one shell size right now this might come across as backwards okay but i know for a fact it's not and we are here to talk about that just share our point of view over there uh this was done to first of all increase the production as well as minimize time of production so that we can have more helmets out in the market uh and we didn't still want to uh, you know take away the element of people having the right sizes on their heads and over their shoulders mm-hmm. so the initial idea for having two shell sizes with the individual thermocols or eps's inside was so that people have proportionate helmets over their bodies based on the head sizes like one size fits all basically creates bobble heads mm-hmm. by the end of the day yeah. that is something which we did not want but i mean over the period of time and after observing and you know assessing we realized that the shell sizes that we were using to cater to our four sizes in the market which is a small medium large and xl we were only you know creating uh, shells with a difference of 6 mm vertically and uh, like upwards mm-hmm. and from front to back so the delta that was so negligible was that so it stopped negligible. making sense basically exactly the yeah. delta was so negligible that we could still give the customers a similar aspect ratio of mm-hmm. wearing the product uh, while still making sure that each product was of the right size how um, in gen 1 we had two shell sizes two head eps mm-hmm. Uh, by the way i just want to also mention that we have a multi density eps system in our helmets since gen 0 obviously so uh, we have one head eps two side eps and one chin eps and they're all assembled com- like tightly stiffly inside uh, as a like a uniform packing so if you look at a uh, uh, eps assembly mm. other than the helmet okay. it look like a like a cyber helmet so because it has all the vent channels yeah, inside yeah, yeah. and the contours are again all interconnected there is no break in flow of the design because it has to match the inner surface of the shell properly even if there is a slight gap that will be that pocket that air pocket where the impact is taken and not transferred onto the eps got it so we cannot let that happen hence each eps has to actually properly fit inside the helmet as well got it so in gen 1 we had uh, two shells two eps two head eps of different sizes common sides and common chins because the main head size is uh, measured from the forehead yeah. and the cheeks are a variable from person to person uh, what we changed uh, from gen 1 to gen 2 is we continued the two different sizes of the head eps but now because the shell was common we added that difference in the side eps as well so now there's a 580 set set of side eps and there's a 620, so 620 set, set of side eps 
compared to the common side EPS in Gen 1. So the delta between the fits of the small and medium and exactly. the medium and large, yeah. sorry, my bad, the large and the extra large, yeah. the delta is actually even more optimized for head sizes than it previously was. Exactly. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you look at it this way, there's the shell, the EPS and then the cheek pads. And this is the transition of the impact, which is, if at, at all, experienced. Now, if we keep the same EPS over there and we reduce the thickness of the cheek pads for different sizes, that last layer is in a way compromised. Okay. So we wanted to not do that. We wanted to make sure that after the first layer of impact, which is the shell, the EPS has enough thickness to minimize the last stage of impact experience, which is the cheek pad. So the end result of how much force reaches the face exactly. is minimized to a very good degree yeah. in the current gen element. Exactly. So it is dampened gradually. Yeah. It's not that there's one layer, there's the other layer, and then the third layer is different for one size and mm -hmm. completely different for the other size. It has to be in that uh, same segment. So it's basically it's a very linear impact reduction as you get exactly. from the outside to the inside. Yeah. Awesome. So that is why we moved to this decision and I believe that it is giving us much more freedom in terms of creating a better product for our users as well as bringing the costs down yeah. while not compromising with safety. So the first one, uh, the Gen 1 was 15,000. Yeah. Now we're able to sell it less than 10,000 yeah. and at actually better safety levels than previously. Yeah, yeah, because we are testing our helmets to again reach the higher standards of safety. The spoiler as well, it still has the street and race interchangeability but executed in a slightly different way. Right. Let's touch upon that. Um, so we had a lot of feedback and thankfully we had a lot of it. Otherwise that wouldn't have changed our point of view in this. Uh, the spoilers. Earlier they were used, uh, they used to fit onto the shell using three points of screws. Uh, that was not a problem, but the main problem comes in terms of handling the material, which is the glass fiber, the composite fiber for our helmets. Glass fiber, composite fiber is a material that is molded, handled, finished, painted, everything by hand. So making precise holes at precise locations in terms of a larger scale in production gets a little tricky, yeah. I would say. It's not difficult, but the consistency is where problem comes up. Right. So making sure that the holes are properly there to uh, align with the plastic part, which is the uh, spoiler, was tricky in terms of production that also added the element of rejections. And uh, while solving for this whole thing of, you know, minimizing rejections, minimizing the production time which is taken, minimizing the assembly time which is taken, which again adds to the overall cost of the product. Uh, we also thought of a new system where the assembly and disassembly of the spoilers gets easier by using a simple snap-on and snap-off system. So again, a lot of testing was done because we know that uh, screws are always, you know, uh, as their reputation is they are stronger or rather the strongest way yeah. of fitting two things together other than welding. But so that's why we tested the product a lot in terms of these snaps. We had like six iterations in mold itself of how strong the snap should be or how loose it should be so that it's not very difficult for the person to uh, operate the spoilers. But this way from three screws, we got down to one screw and that too only on the plastic part level. So now the shells on the back do not have any holes. Uh, that also helps us uh, in you know, improving the overall production quality of right. the helmet. And uh, for the users, we believe that uh, like a quick, uh, just like our visors, the quick release, this is much like a quick release spoiler now. So the only bolt is basically in between the street portion of the spoiler and the full assembly of the race spoiler. Race spoiler yeah. And that is only as a reinforcement. Yeah. I mean, we have tried at high speeds, the race spoiler doesn't pop off even without the screw. Yeah. But for just you know a sense of security we've added that screw as well the cheek pads also only come in one fit now am i right yeah so we've moved from uh, the race to only street fit right now uh, reason being that uh, we are developing uh, another neck roll system okay. of the cheek pads i mean that's not something that we advertise a lot right now because it's still under development but we wanted to add n something more j beyond the densities of the cheek pads to the race fit okay we wanted it to be more track ready, uh, you know, reduce the drag which one feels on the neck, the noise that goes in uh, with the wind. Got it. We want to reduce that whole bit a bit more, for, especially for uh, race users. So we are, you know, taking it back into the 
development stage so basically the the race compatibility part of the helmet it's sort of a work in progress and it will yeah. be available to make the helmet even more track ready exactly when so it the, is here the cheek pads that we are giving right now with alter ego 2.0 they are uh, somewhere in the middle of the street and the race yeah. uh, just to make sure that we're not taking away anything from the customers but simultaneously we're working on you know giving more i mean that's always the idea that that's we just the, add yeah. more value uh actually uh, on that bit all the vents on alter ego 2.0 are now removable so that was going to be the point on which uh, i thought it would be a good idea to end on that so the future plans we have for alter ego 2.0 yeah all the vents the visor to pehle se was removable but the vents are actually very conveniently removable and reattachable so exactly. what are the plans for the future why is that the case now what so, should the customers be looking forward to i'll actually start with what the customers already have all okay. the alter ego 2.0 customers which what they already have is something uh with the serviceability of the product mm-hmm. now we understand that all the vents on a helmet uh add the points of friction in terms of a roll off so first of all like i mentioned previously we wanted all the vents to not go beyond 4 mm of any surface protruding beyond the shell surface got it right but beyond that the vents break off and we cannot foresee the situation in which the helmet falls maybe the person was not even wearing the product but maybe it just fell off which is very normal and it just rolled off and popped off again something and the vent broke some plastic part just yeah i mean flew off like yeah. the safety of the product was not compromised yet the aesthetics of it as the least of our concerns yeah. yet there got affected so in such a situation because previously the vents were break off vents uh, rather than pop off vents they were non serviceable we wanted to cater to that as well in addition to our future plans we we just let let, let me let me just say like uh, like the shells mm. you you can choose the color what you want right yeah so maybe we'll have more options more modularities more modifications possible in, in the more near than future. one component to make yeah it's putting I mean, it out that's there. the idea that's the, that's the idea of the alter ego as well we have six alter egos we are currently actually working on a few more few because more. i mean people are people yes. and we want we people, want to give the people more as well yeah exactly we want people to have as much of themselves onto the helmet awesome man That's so basically in to. the future the experience of the tevra customer should not end at buying the no, helmet no, no, no. Come on, no. so that's something for all of you to look forward to but i think that was a great discussion about the design evolution of the helmet if you have any questions at all uh, please feel free to drop them down in the comments we'll get back to you as soon as possible But yeah that's it for this video thanks also thank you great discussion